Cahill next to us. Um, and many of us um, hope that that goes really well, and we're really glad that you're here. And I apologize for my bio being so long. Um, it was written for something else, and then I just printed it and forgot to reduce some of the things. So um, Beth had said we're going to do a lecture tonight, and we're actually going to do more of a conversation. This is more about conversations on the edge. And what Janet and I want to do is sort of introduce you to um, some of the um, discussions that we have with our tribal colleagues, um, some of the ways we work with um, our neighbors, uh, very little about, bit, very, very little actually about the past, an awful lot about the present and the future. And we're going to kind of go through tag teaming a little bit. I'm going to start with some background, really, and uh, move up to the present day with Janet. So we've been doing river trips uh, with the tribes since 1990, um, bringing them into the Colorado River and working with them um, to help us understand better um, the relationship that they have to the resource. And I thought it was really interesting after one of our trips, and this was um, in 2007, and it actually focusing on the, the bottom quote here, um, this whole slide came off the Las Vegas Paiute um, tribe after the river trip actually hosted a, a, a share site for the photographs for the, from the uh, river trip. And this is what they put up on their website after the trip. The Colorado River, powerful and beautiful, was our guide to our beginning and through the Grand Canyon. This is who we are, this is where we are from, and this is the center of our world. And it was really important to me to realize that after we had done this trip, that they felt um, so connected that this is how they decided to share the experience. The quote from me was, you know, is more bureaucratic. <laughs> For the Wallapai people, we, you know, just would want everybody to know that that experience, the Grand Canyon, coming down on the river, that that you know we we uh, have a presence here in the Grand Canyon. The river itself is considered sacred. It, um, uh, for most Wallapai people, is um, a healing water for them. So in that sense, the river is very sacred. The springs that are located in and around Grand Canyon they are very sacred waters as well. The ancestral homelands um, in the Grand Canyon itself that you see as archaeological manifestations are also uh, very important for the Wallapai people and they would like to see those places preserved and protected. And, you know, just to be respectful when you go hiking, if you happen to go hiking, that, that you do, you know, do it with the realization that that's, that's what you're doing. And I think, you know, that recognition and that respectful, respectfulness uh, for the Wallapai people will be greatly appreciated. And I show this because it's, critical to us to recognize who used to live here and who still does live here, who's connected to these places. And a um, number of, we've been trying over the years to get um, our tribal partners to speak directly to our visitors in a way that we can't. Um, it means a lot for us to know that Loretta was willing to take the time um, and be filmed talking about respecting the canyon and it's actually on our on the park website. And uh, private river runners given, are given this part of our orientation. And there's uh, three different tribes who, who speak to um, our river users about respecting the area. Um, we take a look, though, at Grand Canyon here in the middle. Uh, we are surrounded by a number of um, tribal groups, uh, Hopi, Navajo, Havasupai, Yavapai, Apache down here, uh, the Zuni uh, um, ancestral areas, Wallapai. Las Vegas Pine, Wampa Pine, Chilwitz Band of Pine Indians, Pine Indian Tribe of Utah, uh, Kaibab Pine, San Juan Southern Pine, all of whom um, have um, histories that intersect in Grand Canyon. And there's a lot of confusion sometimes about what do we mean when we talk about traditionally associated tribes. Um, so, so that we were all on the same page, we figured we'd give you the official definition um, that we kind of um, adapted a little bit because the other one was a little longer. Uh, but tribes who remain um, attached to the park despite having been relocated from the area. Um, and 
one of the first uh, times we started working with Zuni, I got a question as to why it was the Zuni were associated with. They don't live anywhere near the Grand Canyon anymore. Well, they used to. Um, they have been relocated, but their ties are still very strong. Uh, the tribe regards park resources as essential to its development and continued identity as a culturally distinct people. Uh, the tribe's association with the park has endured for at least two generations, and the association began prior to the establishment of the park. So that's kind of the official uh, distinction on who's traditionally associated. For us, um, you know, we look again at the park in a little closer view, um, and the tribes typically have very specific areas that they're interested in. Sometimes it's the whole park, sometimes it's very specific areas. The Yavapai Apache Nation, for example, is really interested just in the South Rim. Um, their histories are more tied to there. Um, so it depends, and each tribe will tell us where they are interested in and what they are interested in. And it's not always about archaeology, it's not always about culture, it's about uh, relationships, it's about resources, it's about uh, the present, it's about the future. Um, traditionally important places um, in the canyon, this is uh, Deer Creek Narrows, which is very, very significant for a number of the tribes, especially the uh, Southern Paiute people. Um, you know, different animals that we see. Um, in the, This is actually a picture from one of our tribal colleagues off of one of the river trips that Albino, uh, Big Horn, down by Havasu. Um, different spring sources, all of these are important as living parts of the canyon. We've been working together for a long time. Um, and it's been a great relationship that we've developed. And as an archaeologist, and I've said this to other people when they've talked to me about it, archaeologists typically don't want to deal with living people. That's the whole point of going into archaeology. Um, it's a whole lot easier not to. And when I started working in Grand Canyon, it, um, I was working on a project with the superintendent, who's a fellow named Jack Davis at the time, and they were planning on putting in a parking lot for the Hans Trail. And I'm sure everybody has parked at that parking lot, which doesn't exist. Um, because I had, I was brand new to all of this, and I knew we were supposed to consult, I didn't exactly know how. Um, so we sent these letters out, and the entire Havasupai Tribal Council showed up in the superintendent's office. At which point he said, you know, I think we need to have somebody who actually does this. How about you? Um, and that's how I ended up getting into being the liaison for the park with the tribes. And it was because of the Havasupai's concerns about that location that we don't have a parking lot there. Um, so we've been doing this for a very long time. I officially took over the role in 1989. Um, when we started doing, especially trips on the river looking, because of Glen Canyon Dam operations, we started um, in 1990 with our first river trip. Um, and our general management plan started shortly thereafter. But you know, looking at sites on the ground, um, working out in the field, and this is a, a trip we did a few years ago out at uh, Pasture Wash with a number of uh, folks from the Havasupai tribe joining us, along with a couple folks who are in this audience. I hope you can see yourselves. Um, the river portions are pretty important. We've been doing this a lot. Um, I can't even tell you how many trips now that we've done. It's been so many, but it's it's really important, and it's important to bring folks down. And here we have some folks clowning around, um, but it it are able to reconnect with places that have been disassociated from some of um, the kind of the ongoing cultural traditions. On uh, some of the very early trips, um, one of my first trips, some of the Hopi. Um, uh, religious leaders who were with me kept talking about this place called Twin Springs, Twin Springs, Twin Springs. And we get down to Macy's Paradise and they look up and they say, well, it's right there. And, and it was. It was coming out of two places. It was Twin Springs. They knew where it would be. Um, they just had a different name for it. And this happens repeatedly when you're, they're talking about places and they're describing places. And because I'm familiar with the canyon, I actually know where they're talking about a good portion of the time. And then we try to work to actually get them back connected with that place. Um, we have representatives from all the tribes participating, which is great. Oftentimes they'll make connections with each other as well. Um, they'll find out that they have similar stories about similar places, which was great. Um, this particular trip, we've gone up to look at a site, and our friend Cliff, um, we got off the boats to go up, and this rattlesnake, this pink rattlesnake was right there. 
And he just goes out, he just went up and started talking to it in Hopi. And then he picked it up and he showed everybody and then it went off and it was amazing, really. Um, but we go to different places and from different histories, you, see, you find these connections and they all happen within the canyon. Um, old and young, it's really important too that we have tribal youth going down, a lot of times with the elders, uh, 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 Southern Paiute, Women, Kaibat Paiute actually, um, folks from there and working with some of the younger uh, folks to learn some of the traditions as well and understand some of the stories and even demonstrating some of the uses of some of our archaeological artifacts in the field, which would make some people cringe, but it was perfect. Um, and, and even traditions like um, Diana Sue, it took years to get somebody from Havasupai to come down on the river with us. It just wasn't the right time. And she finally did, and one of the things, that one of the stops one day, she just started making split tree figurines for everybody, and which was great and showed how it was all done. Um, you know, the, the tribes do a lot of work with us, and I'm focusing on some of the river because it's been um, in our minds a lot, but they make recommendations back to us about things that we then do our best to try to implement. Uh, Vulcans thrown down here above Lava Falls. One of the concerns had been that um, folks on river trips leave things, little trinkets, gumbies, offerings, all sorts of stuff on the anvil, and it was offensive. And um, the Kaiba Paiute, a woman named Angie Bullets, and Retta Jackson Kelly from Wallapai had gone to the guides' training sessions and talked about it a lot and written a couple articles in the Boatman's Quarterly. And it's pretty much effective. They, people don't really leave stuff on there anymore. And that's what the whole goal was to educate folks so that they could understand um, what the concerns were and why you shouldn't sort of deface it the way that it had been. Uh, congestion and crowding on the river is a big concern for a lot of the tribes. And one of the things we tried to do with our river plan was adjust the schedule so that we wouldn't have piles of, of people showing up at significant places um, especially Deer Creek all at the same time, so trying to limit the numbers just by doing some changes in how we allow the launches to happen. Um, we all walk in the footsteps of someone, and, it, and it's really um, important to be able to, again, take folks down in the field and then listen to what they have to say and then be able to work with them on the actions and how we can best protect the, uh, the resources in the canyon for a, a lot of different reasons in a lot of different places. And a lot of it's, it's uh, hands-on as well. The methods used for sediment and erosion? This is a stabilization project we did uh, back in 1995. They were assisted by members of the Hopi tribe, the Wallapai tribe, and the Navajo Nation. Other participants Included personnel from Northern Arizona University, the Arizona State Historic Preservation Office, the United States Geological Survey, and the National Forest Service. In total, 26 people were involved with this hands-on erosion control project. The group walked through each arroyo and discussed where and what type of action should be taken. After a consensus was reached, the location for each check dam was numbered and described on the flagging tape. Detailed descriptions were recorded and photographs were also taken. National Park Service archaeologists made certain that all dams were built with culturally sterile material found in the vicinity and that no subsurface cultural features were disturbed. Materials gathered for check dam construction included camel thorn, low brush, and arrowweed. Also collected were driftwood logs and branches, river cobbles and boulders, limestone and sandstone boulders, and lava cobbles were carried in buckets or on rock litters. Over 100 tons of rock were used to complete the project. We talk about the intersection of uh, values, and I think 
that project was one of the first that we did like that where we brought in uh, the soil conservation uh, specialists from the public